What's up everybody? I'm Derek, this is Rocking E-Forge, and today is part 6 of Weird Weapons of History, a series where I research and briefly discuss interesting historical edge weapons that I find pretty unique. Now today's Weird Weapon of History is the first pole arm and axe type weapon that I'm covering in this series, the Lockover Axe. Now the reason I chose the Lockerbur Axe as today's weird weapon of history is because of that unique blade shape, some almost consisting of even a sword-like blade up to 18 inches long, affixed to that shaft in an axe-like configuration, as well as the trademark hook protruding from the shaft itself, which seems to be one of the most common design themes of the different variations of this weapon. Now this is the first video that I've had to actually trust Wikipedia for some of the information I used to write this video, mostly because the sources listed in Wikipedia are either stuck behind paywalls or in the library and I just haven't been able to get off work in time to get to the libraries that have them before they closed, unfortunately. So I've had to rely primarily on a number of sources in the description as well as Wikipedia for some of the dates and some of the purported times that the Lockerbur Axe was used. The Lockerbur Axe originated in Scotland in 1501, and the first recording or description of this weapon was as the Old Scottish Battail Axe of Lockerbur Fasun. Scottish people, please don't come for me in the comments for my pronunciation of various Scottish words in either Scottish Gaelic or Scots or anything else, I apologize in advance. The Lockerbur Axe is also known as the Twig Hatha. No, no doubt that I pronounced that incorrectly. Or, if you're American, the Twag Chaffa, which means Battle Axe in Scottish Gaelic, and it was also known as the Galolach or Galolach Axe in Irish Gaelic, which literally translates to Foreign Warrior Axe in Irish Gaelic. As a side note, my research took me down a rather deep rabbit hole into the differences between Scottish Gaelic, Irish Gaelic, and Scots, which are all distinct languages and actually have a lot of variations and differences between them. Which kind of explains... You feel the same way? It's just no fair marking his back for the hundred coin. It does not want any but yet. Okay? Uh, <laughs> now, the Lockerbur Axe was suggested to have been used primarily by the Highland clans in northern Scotland, and notably, it was purported to have been the primary weapon of the Highlanders in the Battle of Killiecranky during the Jacobite Rising of 1689. It purportedly also saw use in the Jacobite Rising of 1715, and the Jacobite Rising of 1745, otherwise known simply as the 45, because if you're gonna stage an uprising or revolution every 30 or so years, you might as well start naming them. And the Lockerbur Axe did in fact see use in Ireland and parts of Britain as well. Now the reason the Highlanders favored the Lockerbur Axe to such an extent, and the reason that it was typically their, their primary weapon in a lot of these conflicts, is that it was very quick, easy, and inexpensive to, for a blacksmith or a smithy to produce, which meant that many men could be armed in a short period of time whenever someone else got the urge for a good old rebellion. Now, notably, none of the Jacobite rebe rebellions were overly successful. All of them were met with you know, significant force by the British and were defeated. The 45 directly resulted in the passage of laws which outlawed the Highland clan way of life and banned the carrying of weapons by either the Highlander clans or the Scottish people. My research wasn't super clear on that, but it does seem to have been one of the causes that the Lockerbur Axe fell out of disuse as the Highland clans began to disband or just kind of form into the, the Great Britain society, so to speak. Now they have, of course, come back as either decorations, ceremonial weapons, and to be used in reenactments. Now, use of the Lockerbur Axe was as simple and effective as its design, being primarily used, of course, as a chopping or slashing weapon, which afforded the user a bit, ex a bit of extra reach over that of a 
standard woodcutting axe. It was fairly lightweight when compared to other pole arms, which made it more of a, you know, nimble, hand-to-hand, -hand, close combat weapon. And the Highlanders were known to have been excellent warriors, so the Lochaber axe was in fact known to be a very effective weapon on the battlefield. Now notably, during the various Jacobite Risings, only men of high status in the Jacobite army would, you, would be armed with muskets or higher grade basket hilt targs, and as such, most of the Jacobite army was armed with the Lochaber axes going up against much more heavily armed British armies who carried muskets and bayonets, and ultimately could have contributed to the reason that they lost those conflicts. Now, as I'm sure you're curious, the hook on the Lochaber axe has been suggested to have been designed strictly for use against mounted cavalry in order to hook armor or clothing and drag them off the horse in order to, you know, deliver a decisive blow against that enemy and move on to the next. It is suggested that this was actually highly effective in early use since the 1500s by the Highlanders. Now the butt cap on the other end of the haft was used as a bludgeoning weapon or primarily as a a bit of a counterweight for the blade toward the other end to make it easier to swing, but was more of a weapon of opportunity used as a stabbing or bludgeoning part of the weapon primarily. Now the Lochaber axe can be seen in a couple of pieces of pop culture recently, namely season 6 episode 22 of Forged in Fire as that episode's final round weapon, as well as stylized in the video game Diablo 2 Lord of Destruction, in which the weapon was named the Meat Scraper. As usual, if I missed anything or got anything wrong about the Lockaber Axe, please let me know down in the comment section. After covering some of the previous weapons in this series, the Lockaber Axe does seem like, to me, it'll be a little simpler to make than, say, the Kapinga or the Ngulu uh, featured previous in the series, but I'm also really looking forward to trying to figure out a way to test this weapon, because I think it would perform really well in, you know, chopping tests and, and be a lot of fun to see the power that one can actually put behind a weapon of this style. I am currently considering testing each of the weapons when I do try to make all of the weapons in Weird Weapons of History, so let me know in the comments what type of tests you'd like to see for each style of weapon. But don't expect any Forged in Fire level testing. I'm no Jay Nielsen, and I certainly cannot afford to buy a whole pig or a whole hog every time I want to test a weapon. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please drop a like, leave a comment, hit subscribe, ring that notification bell. If you want to support me in the channel further, please consider becoming an honorary striker on my Patreon. Link is in the description below the video. And as always, keep on rocking.